Good evening, I'm Susan Ormiston, and this is The National. A judge rebukes the RCMP for leaving officers fatally outgunned. I guess my husband didn't die in vain. Police gather at an illegal border crossing, anticipating that protests could turn ugly. Obese patients at greater risk of hospital humiliation. I was told not to use the bathroom because I was too fat for their toilet. Plus, Turning Point tackles a troubling question. Are forces at work to downplay the Rohingya crisis? When a gunman terrorized Moncton, fear spread, but it didn't phase the RCMP officers whose job it was to stop him. Three died trying. The question a court answered today was not one of criminal responsibility, rather an employer's responsibility to its employees. Were those officers given what they needed to do their job? Alison Crawford has the story. Flowers for the fallen. The statues of Constables Dave Ross, Fabrice Gévaudan, and Doug Larsh are just a few steps from the Moncton Courthouse, where today a judge found the RCMP guilty of failing to properly train and equip the officers with short-barreled semi-automatic rifles called carbines. Mounties who responded to the shooting rampage that locked down the entire city of Moncton for more than 24 hours had pistols and shotguns, while the shooter had a semi-automatic rifle. Constable Louis-Philippe Terrio says it was pure chaos. As I was lying down on the grass where they told me the shooter was, I was getting most of my information from Facebook. So that's where I was getting, that's how I got the description of, of the shooter. Facebook, that's how I got the picture, that there was no, no way to communicate to all the members. Justice Leslie Jackson took the RCMP to task for years of dithering about whether Mounties needed carbines and then the time it took to roll them out. Almost all members of RCMP management who testified at trial said that safety of their members was a priority of theirs. While they paid lip service to that ideal, their actions, or in this case, inactions, belie that concern. Uh, we expect to call evidence. But the charges related to supervision and leadership in the thick of it all didn't stick. Justice Jackson found that the RCMP, both for cadets and for members, has world-class uh, training programs and that's the reason why the RCMP was found not guilty of counts two and three. For families, today's judgment offers a sliver of peace. Um, I'm happy that there was um, a guilty charge and that um, the RCMP is going to be held accountable and I'm happy that I guess my husband didn't die in vain. The RCMP has yet to admit any wrongdoing. Several Mounties pointed out no senior brass showed up in court. Right? A lot of senior management aren't here. The rank and file are here. The people that live through this are here. We're not forgetting. We're here. Sentencing is scheduled for the end of November. The RCMP is facing a maximum $1 million fine. Many Mounties here say the force could have saved money and built goodwill had it just admitted guilt and apologized. Alison Crawford, CBC News, Moncton. The House of Commons committee says 32,000 asylum seekers have arrived in Canada so far this year, and more than a third are believed to have entered the country illegally. The recent influx isn't sitting well with anti-immigration groups, and some have planned rallies for tomorrow. Tonight, near the busiest unofficial crossing, police are beefing up their presence in case things get out of hand, and David Cochran is there. Behind me here is the Roxham Road border crossing where the latest group of migrants is being loaded onto that white shuttle bus to be taken away for processing. And it's near here tomorrow where the anti-immigrant Storm Alliance is hoping to bring hundreds of protesters and where they're likely to cross paths with the pro-immigration group Solidarity Without Borders. You can also add into that mix hundreds of police officers. There isn't much of a visible police presence here tonight, but our sources tell us that Quebec police and the RCMP have both deployed tactical units to this area in preparation for tomorrow's protests. And it's not just Canadian law enforcement that's reacting. Our sources tell us that on the other side of the border, U.S. tactical units are on standby in case this thing escalates. And already tonight, the U.S. State Department has issued a warning to citizens telling them to plan for disruptions at border crossings in this area. Now, even if this doesn't turn violent, 
violent, the RCMP is planning for disruption. This is an illegal border crossing, but it is an active border crossing with about 50 migrants a day coming across. So there is no way to safely transport them, even in a bus like that, during an active protest situation tomorrow. So what we're told is that the RCMP has brought in additional infrastructure, refrigerators, microwaves, food, knowing that the migrants who arrive here tomorrow in the middle of this protest action will need to be kept here, they'll need to be fed, and they'll need to be looked after as tomorrow's wave of migrants coming to Canada to seek a peaceful life could be arriving in the middle of a potentially violent protest. David Cochran, CBC News, Hemingford, Quebec. And as David mentioned, that border crossing is still a very active entry into Canada. We put that and much more to the Minister of Immigration. That interview is in about 15 minutes. The first Canadian adult convicted of trying to go overseas to join ISIS has been sentenced. Ismail Habib from Quebec was given nine years in prison for trying to join the terror group and for falsifying information to get a passport. The Crown said the sentence is a tough deterrent. We have new information on an ongoing legal battle between the government and an Indigenous teenager. The issue involves medically necessary orthodontic treatment. For Indigenous children, that is a federal responsibility. But as Margot McDermott explains, just arguing over this has racked up quite a public bill. <laughs> Josie Willier was wearing braces when we first met her last year. Her family says a severe overbite and molars that grew in sideways were causing her chronic pain. Like when I smile, I couldn't really smile straight, so it I would, I would never really smile. She's a member of the oh, Sucker what? Creek First Nation. Her family paid for braces, even though severe orthodontic problems are covered under a federal program. That's because when her mother submitted a claim to Health Canada, it was denied. So were three appeals. They bombard you with red tape and terminology and stuff that most people don't even comprehend. <laughs> Now, new information shows the department spent a lot of money fighting Shiner's application. Access to information documents provided to CBC by the NDP show Health Canada spent more than $110,000 in legal fees, fighting the request for $6,000 braces. To see that the government is blatantly wasting money to the tune of $100,000 plus dollars, um, to fight on something that could be easily remedied, which is treating them for what they need, it's, it's absolutely wrong. Indigenous child advocate Cindy Blackstock says it's money better spent elsewhere. That would have brought 18 children orthodontic services instead of fighting them in court. I don't understand why they choose to spend the money litigating versus doing the right thing. Health Canada says Josie Willier's teeth weren't bad enough to make orthodontics medically necessary and that it followed all the rules. That's backed up by a federal court judge who recently decided the procedure followed was fair. There is nothing in the record to suggest that any child in Canada, First Nations or not, would have been treated any differently than Josie was. Advocates say these children have a constitutional right to proper health care and promise to take this all the way to the Supreme Court if they have to. A spokesperson for the Minister of Indigenous Services said in a statement that there are some unacceptable gaps in these programs that the new minister promises to review. Margaret Meacham at CBC News, Ottawa. A salmonella outbreak that sent four people to hospital has prompted a warning about frozen breaded poultry products. So far, there are 13 cases of salmonella poisoning being investigated in four provinces. They all happened between June and August. There's no particular brand being blamed, but Health Canada says after cooking any frozen breaded product, check the internal temperature and wash up after handling. A hospital stay can be stressful and traumatic, and for Canadians living with obesity, it can be especially so. Experts say that many hospitals are ill-equipped to provide adequate care for heavier patients. Health reporter Cass Rusi explains. When it comes to public humiliation, Marty Enixon has a cringe-worthy story. Complications from weight loss surgery several years ago forced him back into hospital, sharing a room with three patients. When he needed to go to the toilet... I was uh, 
told not to use the bathroom because I was too fat for their toilet and I would break their toilet. And you're the expert. You bring Obesity is a chronic disease and should be given the same care and treatment as other chronic conditions, says researcher Mary Forhan. That's why she's looking into whether Canada's hospitals are unable or unwilling to care for patients living with obesity. As a clinician, it was really clear that we were not trained properly or had the right equipment available to us to be able to provide good quality uh, care for patients coming in who were also living with obesity. Frustrating too for doctors who want to care for patients with obesity but can't. There are patients for whom we cannot do the most effective diagnostic tests, which in many cases is a CAT scan or a CT scan. That's because patients with obesity can't fit in most scanners. And giving the right amount of medication is another challenge because there's scant obesity research to guide doctors. Again, we're almost working with one arm tied behind our back in the era of modern medicine. But slowly, hospitals are becoming more sensitive to the changing size and shape of patients. So this is a, a wheelchair that's of bigger dimensions. For At patients. this Toronto uh, hospital, uh, some of the wheelchairs are wider. Blood pressure blood cuffs pressure too. Cuff meant for patients who, whose arms are bigger than average. So I'm going to take you into the bariatric specialty care suite. At the University of Alberta, a simulation room is used to train healthcare workers. To be able to take this lift, we would have the patient here secure in a sling. We'd usually have a minimum of two staff that would do this. And we can actually lower the patient right over the toilet. There's just so much happening in obesity. I'm, I'm very excited. Marty Enixon has become a passionate advocate for others who live with obesity. Obesity. He volunteers his time and plays the role of a patient to train nurses, doctors and medical students, hoping to change not only their approach to caring for patients with obesity, but their attitude too. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, as tensions build around illegal border crossings, we look for answers from the immigration minister. How long can this continue? Plus, the carefully planned debut of a royal couple. Do you think he's proposed already? He may have done. They, you know, they, they may be engaged already. Finance Minister Bill Morneau was at a town hall meeting today in Oakville, Ontario, and what he wanted was public feedback on the government's proposed tax reforms. Well, he sure got it. <laughs> From the moment he appeared to the questions he got, people made their anger at the proposed changes crystal clear. How can you say that we are cheating? We need to reward the winners and not punish them. Morneau says he's targeting loopholes that allow some business owners and individuals to unfairly claim lower tax rates. Another Donald Trump appointee is out. Tom Price, his health secretary, resigned today. Price has been embroiled in a spending controversy, using private charter flights and military jets for government business, which cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Trump said he didn't like the optics of that. Price was tasked with spearheading health care reform, which has hit several walls in Congress. After months of mystery and diplomats' strange illnesses in Cuba, today the U.S. said they were the result of attacks, pulled more than half its staff out of the country and issued a warning to all Americans, Cuba isn't safe. Lindsay Duncombe has the story. Just as Americans with their cash had started slowly coming to Cuba, the U.S. State Department said today, don't go. There will be almost no foreigners here, said this shopkeeper. How are we going to survive? In addition to the travel warning, all but essential American diplomatic staff are going home. It's the official response to what's been described as targeted attacks. More than 20 American diplomats and at least five Canadians experienced bizarre health problems, dizziness, hearing loss, fatigue. The cause? Unknown. Some say a sonic weapon was used. The FBI, the RCMP and Cuban investigators appear to be stumped. They didn't find any devices or anything suspicious on surveillance tape. Well, you're going to see what's happening in Cuba, but some bad, they did some bad things in Cuba. 
President Donald Trump seems to blame the Cubans today, but there's no evidence Cuba was behind this. In fact, Cuba has been cooperating in the investigation, which is looking into the possible involvement of a third party. Cuba is not impressed by today's response. A spokesperson called the action hasty and said it will affect bilateral relations. We have a half a century of work to catch up on. The Obama administration opened diplomatic relations with Cuba, easing some travel restrictions, although a trade embargo remains in effect. Donald Trump has attempted to roll back some of those policies, but not all. The Americans could have gone further. They didn't close the embassy, and they aren't sending any Cuban diplomats home. As for Canada, a spokesperson for Global Affairs Canada said staffing at the embassy in Havana will remain the same, even though some Canadian staff suffered the same mysterious symptoms. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. The head of a U.S. Air Force Academy is getting attention today after he spoke out against racial intolerance at the institution. If you can't treat someone from another race or a different color skin with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. Reach for your phones. I'm serious. Reach for your phones. Earlier this week, racial slurs were written outside the dorm rooms of five black students. Lieutenant General Jay Silveria condemned the act and invoked the recent tensions in the country. We would also be tone deaf not to think about the backdrop of what's going on in our country. Things like Charlottesville and Ferguson, the protests in the NFL. This is our institution and no one can take away our values. An investigation into the dorm incident is ongoing. Yesterday, the acting head of U.S. Homeland Security called the situation in Puerto Rico a good news story. Today, that drew a harsh response from the mayor of San Juan. Damn it, this is not a good news story. This is a people are dying story. This is a life or death story. That good news referenced was the disaster response, which has finally ramped up. But 10 days after Hurricane Mar Maria, millions in Puerto Rico remain without power or water, and more rain today put parts of the island under a flash flood watch. An iconic American landmark looks visibly different today after two major rock slides this week. One person was killed and another injured on Wednesday when a huge slab gave way at El Capitan, the famous granite monolith in Yosemite National Park. At least one other person was injured in a second gigantic collapse yesterday. SpaceX founder Elon Musk has been dreaming big lately. Much has been said and joked about his proposed Hyperloop, a theoretical transit system that would shoot people between Toronto and Montreal in 39 seconds. It's an ambitious idea. Today, he aimed even higher, much higher, all the way to the red planet. Ron Charles explains. Elon Musk got a lot of attention and today for announcing plans that he will concentrate all his SpaceX company's efforts on colonizing Mars with a planned gigantic rocket ship, even though he hasn't even tested the latest and biggest version of his current commercial rocket, Falcon Heavy. Its maiden test voyage is set for November. Nevertheless, Musk has Mars in his sights. Over time, terraforming Mars and making it uh, really a nice place to be. Musk says SpaceX has already begun work on the behemoth, the, Big the Falcon first, Rocket, or BFR. No one has ever attempted a rocket this big, with a huge payload bay eight stories tall. It's capable of carrying a crew of 80 to 120 people or a huge cargo ship. Musk wants to launch two BFR cargo ships to Mars in 2022. He wants to launch the first human missions to Mars two years later. Some space watchers question whether he can do it in this time frame, and others question the environmental impact. We have a lot of problems on our own Earth that we need to fix. And if we're just bringing those problems to another planet and not fixing them, we're just going to ruin another planet. So how will he pay for all this? Musk says SpaceX will use BFRs on commercial missions to launch satellites and supplies to the International Space Station. I know it looks a little big relative to the space station. 
In comments that seemed more musings than plans, Musk also suggested his BFRs could be used to whisk humans from place to place on Earth, LA to Toronto in less than half an hour via outer space. If we're building this thing to go to the moon and Mars, then why not go to other places on Earth as well? Two. This from the head of a company that has launched 39 successful rocket missions to deploy satellites and resupply the space station over the past seven years. But none of the missions has ever included a live human being. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. After months of nuclear and missile tests, North Korea is poised to make a different kind of mark on the international stage and next door in South Korea. This North Korean figure skating pair qualified today for the upcoming Winter Olympics in South Korea. The only North Korean athletes going so far. The hope is that having them there might lower tensions during the games. Straight ahead, asylum seekers crossing into Canada. We have questions for the immigration minister. Ever since I was really young, I always knew, you know, that I wanted to change the world, right? Look this way. <laughs> but before you can change the world, you have to get its attention. Nice Actress Sarah Pauly is certainly a 16-year-old who's had a lion's share of public attention. That's come from 10 years in front of a camera. Even when she played roles in high-profile movies like The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, Sarah knew acting wasn't going to change the world. Are you all right? I remember even when I was five or six, right? I really was persistent with my parents in letting me get into this. No. The thought that I would be an actor when I grew up didn't even enter my mind. It was just sort of something I wanted to do for fun. And it sort of remained like that and still is. And I don't think I ever had any big transition where I decided I'm not going to be an actor. This isn't what I want to do with my life. I just sort of always knew that it, it wasn't my thing. Like, it was just sort of something that I, that I dabbled in and thought was sort of nifty. <laughs> I'm not going to babysit for Uncle Francis anymore. Parts that other actors would die for, like this one in Adam Agoyan's Exotica, Polly wins, even though she's too young to see the film. Her take-it-or-leave-it attitude towards acting probably gets her more parts than she realizes. What has any of this got to do with me, Dad? I don't, I don't think I've ever been bad, but I've never, I've never been a good actor. Like, I mean, or like had like this great talent and done all these different things. I just sort of have taken sides of myself at different times and, and sort of toyed with them. But I don't know, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's... Uh, you know, a great talent that's in my blood or, or anything. It's our life, it's our journey. Ah, beer box, I have the solution. 20 minutes, easy peasy. The food scene here is insane. Set yourself up to be noticed. It's our life. Canada can solve our problem. That's why we are here. We are saying and we don't have any other choice to go back. We don't have any other place to go back. Our mind is made up. We want to come into Canada. To come to Canada. Because we know Canada can save Asylum seekers are still streaming across Canada's border at an unofficial crossing between New York and Quebec. Earlier this week, we brought you some of their stories, including from these women. How did you find out about this I, route? I, I got to see on the TV, oh. yes, and I went to Google, I went to search Google, and I figured out this is what everybody's doing, that Canada has a future for the children, for everybody. So that's why I want to give it a chance. It is a risk, I understand that. I want to take the risk because I know there's a future here for me and the baby. Look at my kids. Please, we need home. Yeah. We need home. You need our, a home. Our children need to go to school. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll be able to stay in Canada? I can work. I can work. I'm an African woman. If I see job, 
I will do it. I want to take care of my children. I want better life for children. We showed those clips to Canada's Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, Ahmed Hussein. I spoke with him earlier today from Ottawa. Thanks for joining us. But no problem. Minister, no matter your government's efforts to dissuade people, asylum seekers just keep coming. So how long are you prepared to staff that crossing 24-7 and allow for more to come in? Well, we are always uh, dedicated to securing our borders and making sure that we have uh, an immigration system that has the full confidence of Canadians. Uh, the numbers fluctuate. Uh, we saw in August uh, very high numbers, but uh, in, the, in the last number of weeks, we've seen the average number of people crossing uh, on a daily basis uh, drop significantly. Well, what are the numbers in the last few weeks? Uh, 50 a day. Uh, that's the average. 50 a day? Yes. So the fact of the matter is... Well, that, that's still 1,500 a month. No, absolutely. Uh, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is we will continue our work and we're not just uh, focusing uh, domestically. We have a very vigorous outreach program that involves uh, social media, that involves uh, using our consulates in the United States to outreach to uh, potential asylum seeker communities in the United States to make sure that they understand the real asylum system in Canada and not be susceptible to myths and, and uh, misinformation. All right, but they are still coming. You saw the two women we spoke to at the border. They think Canada can solve their problems. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. We have made it very clear that, yes, we are open to those seeking uh, sanctuary uh, from persecution, from terrorism and from war, those who are victimized. But uh, if you don't fit into those categories, if you're not a bona fide uh, refugee, then uh, Canada is not the solution to your problems. But, Minister, currently the Immigration and Refugee Board is saying that the average wait is 16 months. They're coming into the country and staying 16 months before they get heard at a refugee hearing. What I can tell you from our end, IRCC has been able, together with CBSA, to reduce the waiting period for eligibility hearings from uh, five to seven months to five to seven days. So we were doing what we can to make sure that we speed up the process. Okay, but what about the 16 months? The Immigration Refugee Board is independent, it's arm's length, they have their own processes. We encourage them to continue uh, pursuing the efficiencies and the reforms that they had begun. As long as there is a chance though, people will try. You're Talking about 1,500 a month, that's more than 15,000 a year on top of those who have already crossed. So how long can this continue? We are experiencing in the world a surge in a num the number of people who are moving both uh, in seek of protection, but also in, seek of a, in search of a, of a better life, of a better opportunity. And so economic migration, uh, refugee flows, IDPs, if you put all those numbers together, it's, it's the highest it's ever been since the Second World War. So we are not the only country that's affected by this. How much is it costing to maintain that RCMP detachment at the unofficial border? Our focus has been to make sure that we uh, maintain the safety and security of Canadians, to make sure that each and every asylum seeker crossing uh, at the border point in La Colle is processed and that no one is released into Canadian society unless they have gone through that very rigorous process. So that has been our focus. That has been our focus. The cost will come later, but this, is, this has been our focus at the moment. I appreciate that, but why can't you tell us how much it's costing? We will be providing those details uh, as soon as we can, but we discourage people from making uh, irregular crossings, they're illegal, you will be apprehended, you will be subject to rigorous screening, and you will be removed if you're found not to be a genuine refugee. In a way, are you encouraging people to apply at the front door, yes, but holding a back door open? We're not uh, holding any door open. We have Canadian law, but we also have international obligations to make sure that uh, people get uh, due process once they're on Canadian soil. As I said, the trends go up and down, but we are, we are vigilant and will remain so. Minister, thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much. Up next, more desperate border crossings, but on a much larger scale. Right now, as we speak, there are about 100,000 children who have no access to schooling. 
Nala Ayed on the bleak outlook for Rohingya asylum seekers in Bangladesh, and a turning point discussion on the world's tepid response. Plus, the monstrous visions of Guillermo del Toro. Let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX edged up 16 points. The dollar decreased slightly. In New York, the Dow gained almost 24 points and the price of oil increased 11 cents a barrel. It was a crowd big enough for royalty. Thousands of people in Edmonton crammed into any spot they could find, all for a glimpse of the Prince of Hockey and his bride. They're celebrities, and it's kind of special, something to always remember. Hundreds of guests arrived decorated with glamour. For a city that loves its hockey, the all-star guest list was a screaming success. <laughs> Gordie Howe. Paul Coffey and the NHL president got so much attention, the crowd almost missed the groom. The bride had slipped in the back door, and inside a private production crew captured the traditional ceremony with the Edmonton Symphony playing background music and the bride's expensive designer dress. For the crowd outside, the first glimpse of the married couple brought more cheers than any of Gretzky's famous goals. Canada's favorite hockey hero and his love story have captured so many hearts here. Well-wishers lined almost every inch of the route to the wedding reception. The Gretzkys are keeping their honeymoon plans a secret. After a very public wedding, they are looking forward to a very private honeymoon. Susan Bonner, CBC News, Edmonton. A perennial Canadian controversy seems to have taken on new life. The Native Sons of Canada have opened once again a campaign for a distinctive national flag and anthem, and they're drawing fire from every part of the country. And so we're joined tonight in one of the most emotion-packed issues of our time, an issue which some people say should not have been brought up at all. I believe that today a flag designed around the maple leaf will symbolize and be a true reflection of the new Canada. When the Prime Minister decides that he's going to tramp on the things of the spirit, then indeed we've arrived at a position not in keeping uh, with the principles of democracy. The flag of Canada there will have to be Four igloos, three totem poles, two codfish And a hint of a fleur de We can live under the same flag we've been living under ever since Canada existed, as far as I'm concerned. Right. One British flag, right? We're a Canada, we're a nation. I would prefer more leaves and like a tree effect. I think it should have maybe two flags. Nice. The federal government's proposed new flag flies for the first time on Parliament Hill. The new flag was run up the flagpole despite a last-ditch effort by the Conservative opposition to prevent it, and an attempt by an individual MP to haul it down. An argument over the new design was waged between several MPs gathered around the flagpole. Early in the afternoon, the government, convinced that the conservative opposition would spin out the debate on the single maple leaf flag indefinitely, made a formal motion of closure. And there were immediate complaints from the opposition that the cabinet was throttling freedom of speech. There it is, a red maple leaf. the next Mr. D. I'm here to audit your class. You got nothing better to do all day than sit here and watch me teach? Go for it. I don't, because my husband's really rich. <laughs> Tuesday at 9.30 on CBC.
This week we've shown you searing images of mass suffering and hunger in Bangladesh. The plight of nearly half a million Rohingya asylum seekers from Myanmar is gaining more attention and also attracting controversy. In a moment we'll ask our Turning Point panel about that, but first let's hear from senior correspondent Nala Ayed, our reporter on the scene. I think it's safe to say that in all the years we've covered refugee crises, I've never seen anything quite like this. At first, it was just simply the sheer scale. Once you drive up the road near the border, there are people simply everywhere. Then you realize that when you talk to people, almost everyone has a harrowing story and often they're quite consistent. They often include the burning down of a village, the loss of family members, and then a dangerous escape here. And they often say, that the people involved are Myanmar military, police, or mobs. Finally, and this is the most distressing aspect of this crisis, is that it's really hard to miss that about 60% of those who have entered Bangladesh over the past month are children. That's a quarter, or more than a quarter of a million children. And so the pressing question in my, in my mind is this. There are already uncertainties about the future of Rohingya, not just here in Bangladesh, but obviously in Myanmar as well. But what does that future look like when so many of the younger generation are starting life in this way? And that means in refugee camps and being entirely reliant on aid. And more crucially, how many more generations will continue to be stateless like their parents? You know, today I met a young boy who spoke a little bit of English, which is quite rare. He told me that he would like to be a doctor. Is that possible in this context, given the fact that right now as we speak, there are about 100,000 children who have no access to schooling? Meanwhile, a couple of days ago, I actually met an older gentleman who has been in this country, he's Rohingya, for 27 years. He still lives in a refugee camp, a difficult life, and he has not been able to go back. So as much as we heard this week that people would like to return, the political complexity of this crisis means that for the foreseeable future, those expanding camps, they are not going anywhere. None of this bodes well for the Rohingya, for Bangladesh, or as the UN Secretary General said yesterday, for the region as a whole because of the risks, radicalization and intercommunal violence. Nalayed, CBC News, near Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. All right, for more on this, let's turn to our Turning Point panelists. Saeed Khan is a professor in the Department of Near East and Asian Studies at Wayne State University. He joins us from Detroit. And Sam Nutt is executive director of War Child Canada. She's here in Toronto. Saeed, I'm going to start with you. It seems that this was a full-blown crisis before a lot of attention was paid to it. Why was that? Well, we have to see, uh, Susan, that this is something that is really decades in the making. Uh, as the report says, uh, yes, the Rohingya refugees are now stateless in Bangladesh, but they're also stateless in Myanmar. They have been stripped of their citizenship. They are utterly uh, marginalized and persecuted by first the military junta and now with the complicity of Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi, as well as Buddhist monks. They have really now been suffocated in their space. And we find that the level of intransigence and outright complicity on the part of the Myanmar government to add to the misery of the Rohingya makes it a very, very difficult situation. Sam, you now have, as Nala described, legions of people descending on a poor country that can't even take care of its own people. What are the biggest risks for these impromptu refugee camps, which are massive? Well, it's responding to that that scale of need, which Nala pointed out. I mean, you're talking about a massive that had it has to be very well coordinated humanitarian response. But when you have so many people arriving so quickly who have health needs and who are, are traumatized, uh, and many kids that are unaccompanied, separated from their parents, so there are real uh, protection risks, security risks. I mean, these are tremendous needs. And then at the same time, you have very little infrastructure, very little capacity, and on the part of the Bangladeshi government as well, there has been uh, certainly a, a an effort to restrict access on the part of various aid organizations and try to control the process. But unfortunately, right now, this area really needs uh, an escalated humanitarian response. And so that means much more open borders, much more access to this kind of population on the part of experienced aid organizations. And unfortunately, that is not something that we're seeing right now. Hmm. Saeed, the BBC is reporting that the UN, some of its officials inside Myanmar, was were deliberately diverting attention from the Rohingya situation. Is that possible? Is it a possible scenario? And how would that have affected international attention? 
Well, this is certainly going to add to the woes of the image of the United Nations uh, coming off uh, last week's uh, opening of the UN General Assembly, where several world leaders, including uh, President Trump, uh, were highly critical of uh, really what is the relevance of uh, the United Nations. But I think at the same time, we have to be cynical that the same voices that are protesting the impotence of the United Nations to act are ones that are, are complicit in creating those circumstances. One of the reasons why the United Nations was unable to do anything here in Myanmar is, first of all, Myanmar has blocked uh, UN observers from even coming into the country to go to the Rakhine province where the uh, Rohingya emanate, and also recognizing how geopolitics are playing a big role. China, of course, is providing full support for the Myanmar government to allow it to do whatever it pleases without fear of any kind of retribution or sanctions, because China has a uh, permanent uh, seat on the UN Security Council with veto power. I want to talk about ethnic cleansing for a moment. There's been an evolution in the talk of that over the week, and I want to just show you two statements from Canada's Foreign Minister, Christia Freeland. Let's take a look. Based on the reports, this looks a lot like ethnic cleansing, and that is not acceptable. Based on reports from the region, this is ethnic cleansing. So that was over a week, looks like and is. Why is there timidity around calling it ethnic cleansing, Sam, and where are we at on that? There's, there's a hesitation sometimes to refer to it as ethnic cleansing because under the responsibility to protect doctrine, that makes a, that creates a, the conditions under which international governments would have a duty to respond, a duty to try to protect this very vulnerable population. Um, and so there often is a lot of kind of holding back when it comes to formally declaring uh, something like this as ethnic cleansing. At the same time, the evidence over the past few weeks has become absolutely irrefutable. You even have the uh, UN Human Rights Commissioner who, who has referred to it as ethnic cleansing. Uh, the Secretary General has also turned around and said that if you don't call it ethnic cleansing, what do you call it? I mean, this is what we're looking at. So I think that uh, over the last few weeks, there is now, uh, there are now more and more governments, more and more UN officials, agencies that are, are calling this for what it is. It certainly has all the hallmarks of, of ethnic cleansing. And now the question becomes, well, how should the world react to provide support to this population under these circumstances? So, and as Saeed has mentioned, I mean, that's very complicated because you've got a, a intransigence on the part of the Myanmar government. So Saeed, what is the next step? When do, does the world start sending in these kinds of signals? Well, I think first of all, there has to be some way to then circumvent the possibility of either a watered-down resolution in the UN Security Council or a flat-out veto by countries like China. It's important to remember that China is looking at a multi-billion dollar investment project just off the coast of where the Rohingya uh, reside in uh, Myanmar. So we have to understand the geopolitics and the geoeconomics that are involved. But I think that if there are circumstances by which countries can then come together outside the United Nations, impose sanctions on the Myanmar government to then provide a disincentive for them to act in the way that they are, at the very least to allow UN observers and NGOs into the country to help stabilize the province and help stabilize the, uh, the conditions for the, the Rohingya. Short of that, there unfortunately doesn't seem to be a very promising future in this. And Sam, Sam, just briefly wrapping up here, what is the most immediate need now and what has to be done in Bangladesh? The most immediate need is, well, at least from a Canadian perspective, is for people to contribute to relief efforts on the ground, for the Canadian government to do the same, and for it to challenge international governments to provide the kind of financial resources immediately, urgently, so that that response can be, uh, can be, can, can be implemented at the, at the field level. Um, but it's going to take a huge amount of resources, and it's going to be a, need a, long, a very long-term strategy. Uh, you've got kids that are potentially going to lose years and years of schooling and lose out on the opportunity to build a safer future for themselves. So we need a, a swift, uh, concerted response, and, and that is something that is within our control as an international community to effect change. It's terribly tragic. It is. Thank you both very much, Saeed Khan and Sam Nutt. When we come back, the making of a royal couple. Prince Harry's casual stroll with his girlfriend was anything but. Under the instruction of the Bank of Canada, two Ottawa firms do most of the processing of currency. Two years ago, 
it was decided to bring out Canadian Elizabethan dollars. The product of the work that began then will be seen this week when the new bills come into use. Open here to give to the tellers. The new bills look a little strange at first. A more mature Queen Elizabeth is on the front. Robins claim territory on the back. The bills are more detailed, more colorful. The bold numbers make it easier for visually impaired people to use. But visually, they don't appeal to everyone. I don't like them. It's ugly. That's why should we change? Canada's new $1 coins came tumbling off the mint's money presses today, and some people are already calling them loonies. They're made of nickel, copper, and recycled old tin cans. They're gold-colored, and they have 11 sides. Last fall, a courier service lost the original design of a voyageur, so it was switched to a loon swimming on a lake. It's coming, the latest addition to Canada's coin collection. Here's a sample token of the new bimetal coin, nickel on the outside with an aluminum bronze center. Now all they have to figure out is what design to put in the middle. There's no shortage of ideas. At the Canadian Mint, there are 19,000 of them. This design embodies the strength and the determination of Canadians from coast to coast. The new bills are smooth, almost slick, with clear windows and they won't be yeah, very easy. I told you. There's a great future, the Bank of Canada says, in bills that feel like plastic. These new banknotes are a 21st century achievement in which all Canadians can take pride and in which all Canadians can place their confidence. When the banks open this week, you'll find the latest symbol of Canada's age of development, the new Canadian dollar. Another famous face at the Invictus Games in Toronto today, Barack Obama was courtside with Prince Harry at a wheelchair basketball game. It has been an incredibly busy week for the Prince, as well as cheering on injured soldiers from 17 countries. He's also met with mental health advocates and with youth. Welcome to the stage, Prince Harry. At yesterday's We Day event, the Prince urged young Canadians to fight to pull down barriers to disabled people. Here, here in Toronto, with both We Day and the Invictus Games, we are saying yes to optimism, yes to hope, and yes to belief. But for all his good works, it was his love life that prompted a lot of attention this week, attracting a slew of reporters, including Roya Nika, a royal correspondent for the Sunday Times of London. We caught up with her at the pulsating We Day event. Roya, how would you describe uh, Prince Harry's leadership of the Invictus Games? I think under Prince Harry, Invictus has become a, it's been a, become a global thing. I think that the, the first games of 2014 in London were a sort of tester um, and they were hugely popular. To see them in Florida last year and now opening here with, you know, Trudeau and Melania Trump, 
hugely exciting for him. He's accomplished exactly what he wanted to with them. How much does this mean to him? It means everything to him. You know, for someone who served in the military, for someone who served in Afghanistan, who's seen the injuries that you know, his fellow soldiers have been through, who's seen what they have to cope with, for him to be able to campaign for them and to raise the awareness for their causes around the world, and he's become an icon of the military, is, I think, the most important part of his job, his working royal life. I saw one of our Canadian forces interviewed and he said his mother would be proud. There's no doubt about that. Diana was all about helping people who didn't have a voice, helping people who might have been forgotten, helping causes that were perhaps, you know, shuffled under the carpet. And I think Harry feels it's so important to keep the cause going and that's exactly what the Invictus Games have done. On the other front, the romance front. What significance was there for them to appear together holding hands at a public event? Huge significance. I don't think you can underestimate the significance of Harry and Meghan appearing together for the first time publicly at the Invictus Games in something that was so carefully managed by Kensington Palace. They have waited for the right time to do that. Of course, it's the city that she lives in. It's a cause incredibly close to his heart. That was a statement of intent. This is the woman I'm going to be with probably for the rest of my life. Do you think he's proposed already? He may have done. They, you know, they, they may be engaged already. I think we won't get we won't get an official announcement until after he's done a trip next month to Denmark, after William and Kate do a uh, European tour in November, and in November the Queen and Prince Philip have their platinum wedding anniversary, which will be marked. I think we'll get an announcement after that. And when do you think the wedding would happen? Well. I think now we've got a new baby Cambridge on the way in the spring. It's very unlikely we have a wedding before that. Because of that, I suspect we may get a wedding early summer next year. Is Britain ready now to accept her? Harry has such goodwill with the British public and actually around the world. I think people just want him to be happy and they can see that she makes him happy. I don't think the noise around her background or her heritage or her career is going to make a difference to their relationship. Has he been given great latitude? I think Harry is intensely aware of the dignity of the monarchy, the position of the monarchy, and respecting that. But at the same time, he is soon going to be sixth in line to the throne. There is an heir, there are many spares. He's not going to have to step up to that role, which gives him and his future wife that much more freedom around their official role within the family. So how do you see the next six months playing out? Well. So what we what we know, what we understand, she's filming in Toronto. Um, she's filming Suits until around November time. She may or may not decide to stop her career within Suits. Then I think if there is an engagement announcement towards the end of this year, which we expect there to be, I think it'd be difficult for her to continue living and working in Canada. And, and after all, if they're going to get married, she needs to she needs to feel what life is like living you know, in London, living in part of that sort of royal circle. It's very, very different. I suspect what we'll see is towards the end of this year, into early next year, her moving from Canada to London to really start preparing for life as a future duchess. From what you've seen, is she up to it? Look, I think she's very used to um, being in front of the cameras. To um, She's not phased by press attention. That said, it, it's a different scale when you enter into the royal family. And let's hope she's up to it because it is the scrutiny that comes with marrying into the royal family is like no other scrutiny in the world. Really, Invictus is a great thing, but this week all anyone is really interested in is Harry and Meghan. Okay, coming up, filmmaker Guillermo del Toro. He tells us why we're living in a time fit for monsters. And the story of maple syrup is told on film. What better way to learn than by watching a movie on television? This is one of the earliest methods used to process food in Canada. Our early settlers not only used to tap their own trees on their own farms, but they used to even plant them along the roadside. And you can still see many of those sugar maples along the roads here in many parts of Canada. At Elmville, Ontario, Wally Greenlaw uses an ultra-modern pipeline to bring the sap from the bush to the sugar shack. 
it's a sealed system. It's on vacuum, so it's a sealed system. Nothing gets in but sap. I just love it up here in the bush, uh, making syrup, and my father with me. And, uh, we like making syrup. I guess that's the, the thing. You know, most people have regarded maple syrup production as a nice hobby, nostalgic and all that, but rarely as a viable business. Well, that may not be the case much longer, because true maple syrup may be on the verge of making a comeback. There's something that in pure maple syrup that you just can't duplicate any other way. I know our sales are up. Every year they're going up, and if you've got a good quality product and market it in a proper way, you'll have no problem. This is one of the largest maple syrup warehouses in the world. Last fall, 27 million pounds were stored here. The huge surplus forced down prices. The market took off and the syrup went with it. A lot of it is bound for the United States, where the appetite for syrup is growing. During a routine inventory check, someone noticed a lot of syrup had disappeared. We were shocked. We, did, we didn't know what, what, what happened. The warehouse that was robbed holds enough maple syrup to fill nearly two Olympic-sized pools. A lot of that was stolen, perhaps millions of dollars worth. The syrup was insured, so producers won't be out any money, but there could be a sticky problem for buyers and processors. They may have to compete with a black market of liquid gold. There is a human and poetic quality in maples, which is easily felt. Many farmers would no more part with their maple bush or orchard than with any precious heirloom. C's Tuesday comedy lineup, Tuesdays beginning at 8 on CBC. Okay, see you. Hello, Jerry. On the next Mr. D. I'm here to audit your class. You got nothing better to do all day than sit here and watch me teach? Go for it. I don't, because my husband's really rich. <laughs> Tuesday at 9.30 on CBC. You may think that thing looks human. Stands on two legs, right? But we're created in the Lord's image. You don't think that's what the Lord looks like, do you? A scene from The Shape of Water by acclaimed director Guillermo del Toro. The movie doesn't open until December, but in Toronto right now, the Art Gallery of Ontario is offering a peek inside del Toro's darkly creative inner world with a new exhibit of his monster memorabilia. And as Eli Glasner reports, it's at once, it's at once scary, strange, and surprisingly relevant. It's the middle of the day and hundreds of fans are waiting hours to meet Hollywood's new favorite monster man. It was just like really breathtaking, like meeting someone like who's like really inspired me with my artwork. The exhibition is called Guillermo del Toro, At Home with Monsters. And stepping inside is a bit like a trip into the director's psyche. Yeah, a lot more, less cluttered, a lot more free than the, the home. But yes, it feels like home. In the 500 pieces from his personal collection, there are looming statues of H.P. Lovecraft and Frankenstein's monster. Some of the monsters are from del Toro's own films, Pan's Labyrinth and Hellboy. Others are creatures he identified with since he was a frail boy growing up in Mexico. They are patron saints of imperfection, I say, because <laughs> they tell you, look, you can be whatever you are and you'll find a place that loves you. And Del Toro isn't the only one embracing his darker side. There was this cloud. While many blockbusters slumped over the summer, the Stephen King adaptation, It, smashed records. Movies such as Mother and Get Out have also struck a chord. Del Toro says that's because the desire to divide ourselves is stronger than ever. When they see you or anyone else as the other, uh, horror ensues. And I think that the, the, the same is true for our political climate, where, you know, when the, the perfect way to divide us is to say, you are with us, they are something else. Which is perhaps why Del Toro has created a love story. The Shape of Water is a romance between a mute woman and a fish man. When he looks at me, he does not know how I am incomplete. He sees me as I am. The movie already won the top prize at the Venice Film Festival, but for Del Toro, the message of his macabre collection and the film is the same. Find beauty in 
the things that are feel alien to you, mm -hmm. and you will find uh, something richer in yourself. You know, something uh, you'll make peace with your own darkness and your own imperfection. So you know, these uh, monsters for me are a healing instrument. And with Del Toro having shot four films in Toronto and talking about creating a studio in Hamilton, Ontario, it seems the filmmaker and his friends have found another home. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. All right, before we go tonight, a recap of a story we are watching. Fears of a showdown tomorrow at Canada's busiest unofficial border crossing in southern Quebec. About 50 migrants enter the country at the Roxham Road crossing every day. There is a concern there could be a confrontation between those who want to help them and anti-immigrant groups who want them gone. All watched over by hundreds of police on both sides of the border. That is The National for Friday night. Check out the news at any hour on our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Susan Ormiston. Have a great start to your weekend.